introduction. He's been, former, uh, he's been the former external affairs minister of India, the minister of law and justice, and also minority affairs. Uh, something many of you might not know, he's actually taught uh, law for three years at Trinity College, Oxford. He's a designated uh, senior advocate at Supreme Court of India. He's also a foremost uh, Congress politician. Uh, one of the many reasons he's come here has been uh, a new publication. He's already had quite a few. I just read out a few of his publications. Beyond Terrorism, New Hope for Kashmir, At Home in India, a Statement of Indian Muslims, The Other Side of the Mountain, and the most recent one, Triple Talaq, Examining Faith. So, would really like if all of you join me in welcoming Mr. Kushid here. Our moderator for the day is Dr. Shruti Kapila, University Lecturer and Faculty of History in Cambridge. And before we begin the event, a few words about our forum. So this is the Cambridge South Asia Forum. Uh, we've been trying to sort of provide a platform uh, for dialogue between all stakeholders in South Asia, so politicians, change makers, and a variety of people. So if you really sort of are looking forward to such programs, please do join us on Facebook and Twitter, and do actively support us. Uh, what we hope from here is to have a lively uh, sort of engagement with, Dr. Uh, with Mr. Kushi, which we can take forward in future events, and I look forward to the program. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. A very warm welcome on what is a very chilly day. We are privileged and honored to have with us such an eminent uh, speaker. So we must thank him for making a very arduous journey from Oxford to here, only to go back to Heathrow after this. So our, we're very, very indebted to him. A particular thank you and welcome to my students studying Indian democracy. Of course, uh, it's very nice to have people who are I'm naturally interested in Indian politics, as South Indian politics, as future voters, politicians, and whatnot. But it's a particular, you know, I'm particularly uh, endorsed in this forum by, by your presence. So do ask questions. He's an amazing speaker. We had an amazing conversation in Oxford uh, two days ago, and he had a, public, a debate at the union in, in Oxford on partition, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. So all sorts of questions should be asked for this. Uh, important historical personage, Mr. Prashid. Well, thank you very much and uh, um, thank you for all, for all being here. I must uh, admit that uh, I've been remiss in, in, in terms of giving attention to Cambridge. Um, every time I've come in recent years, I rush to my old university, my alma mater, and I then go back home. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to, to this uh, attempt this time by your colleagues to bring me here and, uh, and I think that it's something that I should have done a lot earlier but I'm, I'm here finally and that's, that's what matters. Thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for the warm welcome and cold circumstances. Yes. <laughs> uh, I wasn't very clear uh, where to begin and, and, and in which direction to take this discussion, uh, given that uh, we've had uh, an interesting exchange with your, your peers and people, your, uh, people of your generation and, and others at, at Oxford uh, about politics in India. Um, but coming here and, and, and uh, looking at what the possibility is, allow me for short five minutes to tell you about my latest book and I'll leave some copies with you. Yes, sure, sure. If people don't access them, we won't yes. read those. Mm -hmm. uh, read what I've said and they'll be interesting. Uh, and I'll tell you in a moment why I'm telling you about that book. The book is on uh, triple divorce. It's on triple talaq, which is an instantaneous form of talaq or divorce in Islam. Uh, and the book uh, happened because uh, I appeared as, as amicus in the matter before the Supreme Court decided last summer during the vacation. Uh, they sat specially, five judges sat, sat specially to decide it. And your first impressions about Triple Talaq, and I, I can understand why, uh, and across the country in India, uh, that's the case. The first impression is well, there's something, something terribly wrong with it. How can you have uh, triple talaq. How can somebody just stand up and say, I give you divorce and throw the woman out? Uh, and I think that's a natural, natural, acceptable reaction. And then there are all kinds of things to be added to it. Somebody say, 
But isn't it horrible? You do what you give divorce and, and, and you give triple talaq on the Facebook and, and you do it on, on WhatsApp and you do it by writing a letter, etc. Isn't that all very wrong? And I, uh, I, I think that by any, any standard, that is something that would uh, be uh, unacceptable and irksome to anybody who believes in, in a degree of equality and this, the life that we commit ourselves to under the constitution in India. And therefore it was important to explain what this context, context of talaq, divorce, and triple talaq is, which is an instant form of divorce. So please hear me carefully, because if you miss one little link, then everything goes, goes haywire. One of the judges, uh, who's I think one of our brightest judges in the Supreme Court, uh, who's a lawyer and directly came to the Supreme Court to become a judge three years ago, uh, is uh, the judge called Ronington Nariman. His father is a very, very eminent lawyer, and uh, Ronington himself was solicitor general of our country, and he's now one of our brightest judges. Rohinton Nariman struck down whatever triple talaq is and said, this is not valid, this cannot be accepted under any law. <coughs> but he says this, and he also says something else in his judgment, and therefore his judgment becomes very interesting. He says, Islam provides the most shockingly modern system of divorce, of marriage and divorce. He says this in that very judgment in which he outlaws triple talaq. Now that's the interesting contradiction that we need to understand. And I think Cambridge is the best place for us to understand that. There were five judges. The Chief Justice, Justice Kehar, was a Sikh. There was another judge, Brenton Nariman, uh, is, is, a, uh, is a Parsi. Uh, there was a Muslim judge, uh, Justice Nazeeb, who sided with, with Chief Justice. And then there was a Christian judge, uh, Justice Korean Joseph, and that's five, and one Hindu judge, uh, Justice Lalit, who sided with Rohingtan Nariman, with, with, with Justice uh, Rohingtan Nariman. Uh, the Chief Justice and one judge who supported him said, uh, Triple Talaq is part of Islam. It's been part of Islam for 1400 years, and therefore it's part of of uh, personal law and of fundamental right. We can't interfere with it. But on a concession from the Muslim personal law board, uh, their concession, a categorical and clear concession made by them, he said, although we cannot interfere with it, they have conceded and therefore we direct that parliament can, can change the law. Parliament can legislate to take this right away or to take this this uh, procedure away, and we direct the parliament to do this within six months, and for six months we will put a stay on triple talaq. So it's an interesting construct. It's a fundamental right, we cannot interfere, but they concede that parliament can intervene, parliament should intervene within six months, and therefore for six months we put an end to triple talaq. That was two judges. Then that judgment came out first, so everybody assumed that that was the law. Then came Justice Korean Joseph, and Justice Korean Joseph said, I've looked at the following verses of the Quran, I don't find in the Quran any validation for triple talaq, therefore I hold that triple talaq is not part of Islam, and therefore we needn't give any attention to triple talaq, certainly not assume that it has any legal implications. So it's like saying something in the air, it means nothing. That was Korean Joseph. Justice Nariman with Justice Lalit said, this is something that's been there for a long time. It's been part of Islamic law, it's been part of personal law. That personal law has been incorporated into the general law of the land. The general law of the land is subject to the Constitution. Constitution Article 14 will not allow this kind of discrimination, so I outlaw it. And that's it. So there is no triple talaq with Korean Joseph and the other two judges, three judges have said no triple talaq, two have said parliament must, must intervene. And as you know, and I believe there's some law students here, that's a minor, my, there's a minority judgment and it has no meaning in, in, in view of the majority judgment. Now, this, is, this has happened 
But what is triple talaq? Let me explain to you quickly. And how bad it can be, and why does Korean Joseph say that this is the, this is a shockingly modern 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 system of, of uh, marriage and divorce? In Islam, according to the Quran, uh, any man can give divorce in his lifetime to a woman, to the person that he is married to, only three times. Why three times? Because if you say talaq, it triggers a process of divorce, sort of, of extra legal separation. It's called the Iddat period. The purpose of the Iddat period is to be to ascertain whether your wife is carrying your child, because that had consequences on maintenance rights and so on. And those three months get triggered by your pronouncement of talaq. Within those three months, you can take it back. You can change your mind and say, I, I'm taking back my pro proclamation of divorce, and everything becomes normal. If you don't take it back in three months, then it gets completed in three months, the divorce becomes final, but you're free to marry the same woman again, provided she agrees. You can say the a second time as well, and the same thing will follow. It can be said second time in the three months that are being triggered, or it can be said, said a second time, second time, afresh after you've taken it back for the first time. You can again say it, three months start. Within those three months, again you can take back. If the three months get completed, again you, have, you are free to marry the woman again. However, if you say it for the third time, either during the three, term, three months that have been triggered, or stayed for the third time, independent of those three months, you then have no choice to take it back. You also have no choice after three months to remarry the woman if you want to. And that's because, I assume, it was believed that, you know, giving you two opportunities was enough. The third time you did it was then really something that couldn't be condoned and that you would then have to be told no further marriages with this woman and certainly no right to take it back. That's the end. You don't deserve any further liberty. This is what triple talaq is about. Now you can take a position and say talaq itself is bad. Can't have it for various reasons. Or you can say the triple talaq, the way it's given, which is in one instant, talaq, talaq, talaq is bad. We're only interfering with triple talaq, not with talaq. The court finally has, in whichever way it's pronounced, it has given a response to triple talaq. It has said nothing about talaq, although the Attorney General then was, was, was uh, hopeful that they could get talaq out of the way and then provide fresh legislation entirely. But that obviously, obviously didn't happen. Now, even talaq, given that triple talaq has been outlawed, even talaq would be questioned as being unilateral, as being unfair, as not being gender neutral, as giving an advantage to the man or the woman, etc. The answer there is that if talaq is done properly, talaq requires mediation and reconciliation by members of the two families before talaq can be effective. And if, that's, that's, if that is necessary, and the, the solution for that, and I believe it in Pakistan, is that if you want to give talaq, you have to register and say, I want to pronounce talaq. You then have to show that there has been an attempt to reconcile and to mediate. And in fact, if that doesn't work, your talaq becomes effective. I've argued that it doesn't work has to be communicated to somebody, it should be a family judge or an adjudicator or a kazi or some person who then can say, yes, thank you, I checked, your mediation hasn't worked, your talaq can now proceed. Now, so it isn't that you can just sit at home and say, I've given you talaq. There has to be something more. And that's what gives some form to the manner in which talaq can be given. But why didn't the woman have this right? So you research further and you find that there is the, an Islamic marriage is a contract. And the contract has to, be, has to have two people. And the woman has to agree to the terms of contract. One essential term of the contract is the dower that is to be paid, called meher, that is to be paid for the contract, for the marriage, consideration, 
by the man to the woman. That's one important term. But there can be another term. There can be a term which, which gives the woman the right to give the love. A delegated right from the man to the woman for her to give the love if she wants to. But irrespective of this contract and the terms of the contract, she also has another right of dissolution of marriage called kula. And people say, well, if she had the right of kula, which is equivalent to talaq, why does she have to go someone to seek a kula? And the answer is quite simple, quite simple. Because when she gets kula, dissolution of marriage, she needs maintenance, she needs protection for her children, she needs that period of three months in which she, she has, to, has to be provided with accommodation, residence, etc. And therefore she needs somebody to ensure that this is done, which is the reason why she goes to an adjudicator or she goes to a kazi or a family, family judge. Very little difference there between a man and a woman. Man doesn't need all these things and that's what is assumed from uh, from, from a practical sense, but a woman requires all this and therefore she has to go to, to a family judge. Besides uh, kula, which is uh, dissolution of marriage, there can also be, in Islam, uh, marriage by, uh, a divorce by mutual consent, which is something which is of, a, of very late sort of, late uh, uh, kind of development in the law in the world, and certainly in India it's, it's uh, very, very recent perhaps it's 20 years ago that this happened, where there's a no-fault system of divorce, mutual consent, irretrievable breakdown of marriage, assessment of that is made by, by the couple themselves, and they go to someone who says, and say, please release us from this marriage bond. Beyond that, there's also an annulment process that a woman can bring before the family judge to say, for a variety of reasons, some of them, some of them similar to the ones you find in the general law, uh, I, I want this marriage to be annulled, and the marriage, marriage can be annulled, cruelty being one of the grounds of annulment. Now, if you take this entire system, then Islamic law is not as unfair as it sounds or is made out to be. And this is what the Supreme Court seems to have suggested. Now, if that's the case, why is the government inclined and determined to bring legislation which is the latest legislation stalled at present in the upper house on triple talaq. And that legislation essentially provides and it defines triple talaq as an instantaneous form of talaq. I've argued there that government saying that this is an instantaneous form of talaq is not accurate. It was an instantaneous form of talaq. The Supreme Court has put an end to it. So there is no instantaneous form of talaq. And when there is uh, uh, no instantaneous form of talaq, then under what principles of jurisprudence is the man who utters triple talaq to be punished to the extent of possibly have been having to go to prison for three years? <coughs> this is a big question that has come. That we are punishing somebody for doing an impossible act. And the first principle of genealogy is that you don't punish for an impossible act. You have to punish not for intention alone, you, pension, you punish for, pension, for intention and the act that follows and is the combination of intention and act that causes the culpability and therefore the need to punish the person and impose the sanction. Now this is a broad perspective uh, about, we are not here really to discuss the law in, in great detail, I'm sure there are a lot of people here who know uh, a great deal about this, but why is this, if it's such a simple thing, and this is how simply the Supreme Court has, has uh, pronounced on it. Why is it so important? Why did I need to write a book about it? Why, why is everyone still debating it? Why is Parliament still determined to bring fresh legislation? And that is, the answer to that lies in your topic that I was to address today, which is the politics of India. The politics of India is to identify a demon and slaughter it. Uh, and this is true, not by, not, uh, not for one party alone. There are demons for every party in our country. There no, it goes far beyond saying that we have a vision, we have an aspiration, we have an object, objective, we have a view, uh, we have a plan for the country. That's, that's true democracy anywhere in the world. But in India, sadly, over the years, we've turned to demonology. Uh, democracy has turned to demonology. So you create a demon of the other. Now, that may be true, and I think that that's arguable, 
that the liberal or what are described as liberal parties or left-wing parties created demons of the conservative parties and the conservative parties have created demons of the liberal and the left parties and some of the demons and there are a variety of demons there are caste demons there are anti uh, there are anti dalit demons there are there are there are uh, uh, anti farmer demons but one of the demons that that uh, have played a prominent role in politics in recent years is the demon of appeasement of a minority that in a in a democracy minority have has have rights of these two as much as the majority have rights and you can't sort of say that democracy uh, means that the majority will not have its views prevail the majority must be must be uh, must be given uh, the first right that it were to have its views to prevail but the majority has to work within constraints of constitutionalism and the constitutionalism is essentially about balancing the rights of a majority could be a temporary majority could be a permanent majority could be a majority on a particular topic could be a majority on a particular issue and the minority on any of those issues now this is a, there's an interesting discussion on this which takes us into an amazing amazing level of of remarkable level of intellectual authority and that's in the supreme court please look at it it's the judgment on privacy that's been that's been written by chief, Ju chief justice chandrachur son who's now in the supreme court justice chandrachur one of our remarkable judges who've talked about this idea of dignity of the human being autonomy of the human being uh, and the right to be right to be different uh, and there i believe although the uh, the traditional minority majority uh, debate in our country didn't pick this up i believe some of the strongest arguments for the minority of one or minorities have been have been articulated in this judgment and if uh, minority groups were only sensitive to the arguments that have been made in this judgment they would have something something very very significant and important in their favor um, so the articulation that we have been accustomed to over the years which is today being demonized which is today being rejected that it's secular versus versus non secular it is secular versus religion etc are are barriers that can easily be broken today by something that that can appeal to both sides to both sides under the idea of dignity and uh, autonomy and and personal freedom so conscious the freedom of conscience the freedom of thought freedom of expression and conduct and personal behavior and the state not not having a role in what you do at home are critical critical decisions that have been indicated in the judgment and i believe that this judgment will become a test stone for for many 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 com, uh, conflicting positions and it's already started right now the supreme court is hearing the aadhaar case which is uh, taking your biometrics to ident give you an identity and uh, whether that that violates this judgment is one of the questions that have arisen before before the court so essentially the kind of politics that we are indulging in and there are many dimensions and when you ask me questions about any dimension of the uh, functional politics that we see today in the country and the the conflicting uh, Uh, postures and positions that are that are taken uh, they all must be understood in this trend of our politics which is a sad trend that you reduced everything every idea and every contested position to the other side uh, other side being a demon and that what you need to do is to strike at the demon and when we do this kind of politics in our country what is the what is the 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 biggest uh, uh, the largest victim and the greatest price that we pay uh, and that is for uh, that obviously is the growth of a country now if we are going to be a divided country if we begin to look like pakistan a divided country bangladesh a divided country afghanistan a divided country parts of balkans as and when they were divided country if we begin to look like them 
would we be able to sustain our position in the world as one of the foremost emerging, emerging models, not just of the economy, but of political economy, of democracy, of a civilizational, a civilizational uh, system and structure that offers hope to, to uh, millions of people. Uh, that is going to be affected. And what is intrinsically being going to be affected is something called the idea of India. Now, is it that is it that there is a core? And I give you, uh, I give you just something to think about. The Indian Supreme Court has said that our constitution has elements in it that you can never change. Mm -hmm. Now, some people thought that there was uh, politically and philosophically there was a false thing to do. How can anyone say that a democratic majority? Uh, particularly if it's a two-thirds democratic, democratic majority, can't change the Constitution. Uh, but the Supreme Court said a basic structure of the Constitution can't be changed. And I do believe there is a lot of jurisprudence here in Cambridge and, and Oxford where the, uh, whether it's, it's Hart or it's Dworkin uh, or it's uh, the natural lawyers, etc., who do believe that a thought or an idea or a proposition can be altered but Beyond the point, if it's altered, it doesn't remain the same proposition. It becomes something different. And that's the core of the Indian uh, constitutional theory of uh, basic structure of the constitution. Now, if the idea of India, and I'm extrapolating from the basic structure theory, if the idea of India has a basic structure of Indian philosophical thought, then can political <coughs> majorities or transient majorities change that idea of India is a big question. But of course, the, the response to that will be that this was not really an idea of India. This was an imposed idea by people who studied at Cambridge and Oxford who came back and said, this is what India is, and therefore, therefore it needs to be changed. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting contest that is, that is going on in our country, but uh, it's not always put in such simple terms. I mean, it's complicated in various, various uh, manners, some of which are not necessarily very attractive or honorable. Uh, but essentially, this is the quest and this is the contest that is taking place in the country. What is the idea of India? And uh, how do we sustain it? And ultimately, I believe, that uh, politics at the highest level must address that issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, once again, uh, I mean, what a joy to hear uh, such an eloquent uh, speaker uh, sort of touching on such uh, vast a number of things here. I'm not going to give a comment because we did uh, sort of do that uh, just a couple of days ago. But may I just ask a first question, which is to ask you, uh, it sounds like a party political question, but it's actually not a party political question, which is to say that uh, why is it that it was the BJP government that decided to legislate on the Tibet mark? Because after all, you know, in this, you know, I mean, I think we need an answer uh, to that. Uh, uh, you know, after all, the debate on personal law has been raging since the Shahbano case, uh, at least since the Shahbano case. And of course, going back further, actually, the Hindu Code Bill in the 50s itself, which remained unreformed, and ironically, it's the Hindu Code Bill, which is so unreformed. Uh, uh, so I was just wondering uh, how, as a practitioner of politics, as a lawyer, but as someone who's witnessed these politics for at least 20, 30 years, uh, why this particular movement for it, and why, what does this debate of the, not just the mechanics of Triple Tala, yeah. But the fact that it is, you know, it is, it is sought to be. Why now? Why now? And by the BJP. Well, three quick responses to that. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned the Hindu Code Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some, uh, despite despite disappointments uh, that the protagonists must have had, uh, there have been some remarkable, remarkable reform, as you know, mm -hmm. that's been that's has been put in place both at the time when, when Nehru and, yes. and uh, Rajiv Prashad disagreed on the speed and the content. And in more recent years, further changes have come. I mean, mm -hmm. for instance, on the joint Hindu family, yes. there are some remarkable, remarkable changes that have been made. 
to give greater rights to 